Well, welcome Bethel family. Thank you for joining us for our online annual meeting. I, I know that you're in for a treat. This is going to be an incredible celebration of all that God's done over the last 12 months and what he's done during this unprecedented time that we're living in, this, this global pandemic that we're attempting to walk through. You know, none of us have been through a moment like this, I'm guessing. And the severity of these last four months, it is real. It's so real that we know that it's taken people's lives. Some of those are people that attend Bethel, people that are moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, friends, neighbors. I had a woman that's a part of our church email me the other day that her husband recently died from covid It's serious and it's taking people's lives. But even on top of that, this pandemic, we know that it's shaken uh, global finances. For some of you, it has shaken your own personal provisions. Heap on top of that, the implications of being socially distanced and isolated for as long as we have. It's led to what many experts are calling a mental health crisis in our country. We see the implications of this everywhere that we look and every day that we wake up and turn on the news or look at the news feed. The reality of it is always before us. What I want to do is I just want to challenge us over these next few moments together to just pause. I'm not asking you to necessarily look away from all that's going on, but I do want you to pause with us and I want you to look up. I want you to look back as we look back and I want you to look around at all that God is doing in and through Bethel Church during this time, these last four months, but even over this last year. And we know that God has, has purposes in this time. He has purposes that are so much bigger than our pain. And he's not wanting to waste this pandemic. He wants to move and he is working through all of the different scenarios that we're walking through. And he's not waiting for this pandemic to be over. He wants to work right here and right now. So while many things have changed, I just want you to know that our mission has never changed. Bethel Church, even though we've adjusted, we are still attempting to make disciples of every generation, both locally and globally. But the way that we've been doing that, as you are aware, it has changed significantly. If I could summarize in just three simple words where we find ourselves over the last four months as a church, those three words would be flexible, adaptable, and agile. Now, if you've been part of a church for more than a minute, you know that those are three words that don't typically uh, identify or or, or paint uh, a, a church in any way. Flexible, adaptable, and agile. They're usually the opposite of that. But I just want to thank you, Bethel family, because in spite of the difficulties, you have been incredibly flexible, incredibly adaptable, and you, in the speed in which you've adapted, you've been incredibly agile. I just want to thank you for that. Uh, I was reminded of this incredible quote by A.W. Tozier, who said this, Worshippers never leave church. We carry our sanctuary with us wherever we go. Isn't that good? I just want to thank you, Bethel family, for taking your sanctuary with you into your home for a season and into your neighborhood. You know, in some ways, the last four months, it's felt like 40 years in the desert. But I want to remind you that God is at work and he has been at work, not just through this pandemic, but over this last year at Bethel Church. We've got some stories that we want to share with you and I think you're going to be encouraged by all that the Lord is doing in and through Bethel Church this last year to make disciples. Let's take a listen.
Greetings, Bethel Church. On May 4th, we unanimously agreed that we would offer Jason the senior pastor position and present him to the body for vote. I'm excited to share with you that on May 5th, Jason accepted the nomination. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be affirmed by you in incredible numbers uh, this past week as your next senior pastor. I am truly honored and humbled by the opportunity to lead you and to serve alongside you uh, for as long as God would have us together. So I just wanna say thanks so much. Lord still does miracles, and the greatest miracle he can do is the miracle of salvation. And uh, this is a story with a, a young girl in high school ministry um, that the Lord brought back to himself. Uh, it was about February, and we had met at Roaster's Coffee Lab as a high school ministry um, prior to, to everything going on. And uh, and we, we meet there every week just to build relationships with students. And for some reason, this girl walks in, and, and we've never seen her before, but for some reason, she had heard that we um, met for coffee and, um, and got to know each other and as a, as a high school ministry and uh, it, was, it was crazy because we'd never seen her but you know I think it was by the grace of God that all the other students left you know kind of when the um the, the, se the session and your kind of hangout time ended and, and she was left there waiting for a ride and uh, myself uh, and two other leaders we, we got to sit there and just build a relationship ask her questions about her life and we come to find out that she was um, pursuing Jesus and, and wanting to know a relationship with him but but didn't have anybody around her that uh, could, could, could teach her and, and share the gospel with her and so um, Long story short, we found out that she was being actually being heavily persecuted by her family. Um, they grew up; she grew up in a devout Catholic family, and every time she wanted to even go to church, they would uh, resist it, and she'd sometimes even get grounded for it. Um, but she she had seen that we were going to a conference as a, as a ministry together, and she desperately wanted to go, but did not have the money or resources. And uh, I talked with the leaders, and, and we we felt on the on our hearts we had to get this girl to this conference. And so, long story short, she came to this conference and ended up giving her whole life to Jesus. And it's just a beautiful testimony about how God is, is bringing in people um, to himself. Uh, we didn't even know where she came from. He just brought her to us and uh, he's so faithful and so good. And it just uh, is an amazing testimony of his power and his mercy. So you've probably heard it said that the Lord a lot of times goes before us. And about three years ago, we created our healing and recovery and really dug into our pastoral care ministry here. And wow, have we seen in the last year how the Lord prepared us for this time. Our uh, Stephen ministry has grown to 58 caregivers, and they have been busy in the last six to eight months and providing a lot of care and a lot of help to people in need, from people who have lost loved ones to people going uh, through marital difficulties to just uh, depression and all kinds of issues. Our Stephen ministers have provided amazing care in the last year. We also have our uh, healing and recovery groups and also our counseling network, and we have just seen it grow tremendously, the amount of people in our community and in our church family who have utilized those services. It has been amazing to see how the Lord prepared us three years ago to be in the position that we're in now to be able to provide care and hope and healing, to carry people's burdens and lead them to the hope that we have that Christ sets before us. So imagine with me, if you will, you're at work, you've just been assigned to a project that you are super passionate about, and there's another project manager that you need to work with, and that person seems to have a vendetta against you. You've got notes, you've got all kinds of plans that you're excited to share, but you just keep getting shot down. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that but it's extremely frustrating. Imagine if that person was a fellow believer in Christ and imagine if that project was actually a ministry. It compounds because you expect more, you expect different. You think we all get along. Frustration, disbelief, animosity begin to give way to bitterness and unforgiveness. And this is a true story that took place here at Bethel. And to protect people's identity, we've changed the names. We'll just call that person Sammy and the co-lead, Ted. So Sammy was working through these feelings of frustration, approached Ted, 
thinking that that was going to resolve everything. It didn't. It just made it worse. They even went in for a second time. Nope. It just got deeper and deeper into bitterness and unforgiveness. So Samuel let it go, supposedly. But what happened? Sammy got involved in Rooted. And if you're familiar with Rooted on week five, you're going to go through a strongholds assessment. Sammy, when they knew that was coming, he was like, oh, man, I don't want to do that. Because he knew the Holy Spirit was coming for him. And that God was going to deal with that bitterness and unforgiveness. But instead of run from it, Sammy headed it face on. What happened? Peace. Forgiveness. Sammy left that night starting to think through strategically how are they going to then pursue reconciliation with this person, with Ted. And it just so happens that as they were going out into the parking lot one day, thinking on this very thing, Ted comes running out of nowhere. Unbeknownst to Sammy, the Holy Spirit was working on Ted as well. The two of them, they talked it out. They were open. They spoke in love, humility, and forgiveness was achieved in a Christ-like reconciliation. The reason I'm sharing this story above other stories is because right now in our nation and in our church, Division seems all too common a word. And this is one of those things that we need to hear more of. It's the kind of thing that God's all about. Over the last four years, the Pasco men's ministry over there has, at Pasco has been hosting a men's retreat. Now, each year we've seen several people come to know the Lord or be challenged in ways that would, would help him grow. Well, last year, there was a young guy that came to our campus. He just started going to church. He was new. He didn't know anybody. Uh, he, he really didn't seem like he had a relationship with Christ. But several of the men on our campus were, they just came around him. You know, they're excited to see him. And they invited him to the retreat. And they wanted to teach him what a relationship with Christ looked like. So after we returned from that retreat, this, this guy got into a small group. And it ended up being a group that went through Rooted together. Now, shortly after that had started, the, the Rooted leader came up to me and said, I, I, don't, I don't think this guy knows the Lord. Well, he didn't, but the group, through just the, through patience and, and putting into this young guy's life, um, during the rooted session, he proclaimed Christ as his Savior. He came to know the Lord, and then he decided that he wanted to go back to the retreat again for a second time. So this past March, this year, when, when we went to the retreat, this young guy, he just, he just, man, he wanted to get baptized. And there is a river at the retreat. Now, this was in March, and, and it was pretty cold. So the retreat leaders, we talked about it, and we decided that we could do a baptism up at the retreat. And while, while we were there, one afternoon, it was right after lunch, we all gathered at the river. I mean, the old-time gather at the river deal. And, and one of our leaders went into the water and, and baptized this young guy. And that was, that was a, it was a great, great picture of the Lord leading him you know, to come to know him and to make a public proclamation of his faith. And by the way, the, the, the temperature in the water could not have been over 40 degrees. So it was, a, it was a, a serious commitment that he made. Now, over the past year or so, um, we've seen God work in this guy's life. He's been moving him along. He's been moving him ahead. And the, the great thing now, this fella is doing the same thing in his brother's life, that the, the men of our campus did for him. They are bringing him along and teaching him what it looks like to follow Christ. All right, so I get to tell you today about a story of God's work in the life of a girl who we will call Hope. So you may or may not know that a couple years ago at our Richland campus, we launched a ministry working together with the Care and Compassion team called Embrace Grace. And it's a ministry where we come alongside girls, young women who are um, find themselves with an unplanned pregnancy, and many times they would turn somewhere other than the church. But with a program of Embrace Grace, they are welcomed into the church and to a series of classes and to, with leaders that will walk alongside of them. So Hope came to us in the fall, pregnant, um, wounded, alone. She needed a lot of things. And her leaders walked faithfully with her as she gave birth to her little baby girl, we showered her with lots of blessings um, in a baby shower. There were meals. But more than that, she learned about the hope of Jesus. Because hope had experienced lots of trauma in her life. And really, when you looked into her eyes, there was no life there. 
Hope stayed with us, and she went through not just Embrace Grace, but the next two semesters of Embrace Life, and she really learned to do life in community with leaders and others who loved her well. Um, She gave her life to Jesus, asked him to be Savior and Lord, and she didn't stop there. She kept learning and growing, and when Embrace Life ended, she joined Women's Bible Study, because by that time, Bethel was her church home. So every Sunday, you can see her in church, um, sometimes alone and sometimes with her husband because she got married as well. And together, they are expecting another little baby. And so what I would say to you, if you met her now, you would see the love of Jesus in her eyes. And she would tell you about the hope that she's found in him and the healing. And she would tell you about girls who have walked alongside of her faithfully in this season, allowed her to ask hard questions and pointed her always to Jesus. Because first she experienced his love in tangible ways, and then she learned of it and experienced it herself. So I would say, well done, Bethel Church. Thanks for coming alongside all of our women, and especially these. Um, It's a beautiful story that God is writing. Our Bethel Assistance Ministry has been very active and very busy in the last year. We changed some of our processes up. We created a food pantry thanks to the Gunyan family. And we have utilized both of those heavily uh, as we've been able to care for families this past year especially. I did want to mention a story about one family that we've been assisting. Uh, David and Linda Boothroyd's small group partnered with BAM to come alongside and assist a family that was referred to us by a nurse here in the Tri-Cities. They have a newborn daughter who was born with a very critical illness. And so they uh, had brought her back from the hospital in Spokane. And one of the things that they were really concerned about with COVID was as one worked, the other stayed home and there was not opportunity for them to get out to a laundry mat. And there was also risk in that because their daughter was still critically ill and they didn't want to expose her to many germs. And so we were able to uh, find a used washer and dryer that we could provide for that family through BAM funds. And then that small group of the Boothroids came alongside that family. And together we were able to partner and provide diapers and formula, clothing and food and gas cards. And those gas cards have helped that family go back and forth to the Children's Hospital in Spokane. Linda and Dave's small group have continued to minister to that family. They provide not only um, for their physical needs, but also their spiritual needs. And it's been a great partnership. We've also been able to connect them with some of our partner agencies here in town that have provided resources as well. So that's a great example of how the body comes together through BAM, through our partner agencies, through a small group, and are able collectively to love on a family in need. And it's been a great opportunity. So when I was looking back on this last year, I was thinking about all the amazing stories that God has done in young adults' lives uh, at Bethel. And this one girl's story stuck out particular. Her name's Jessica. And Jessica's story goes like this. She shared this with me, and I thought it was so beautiful. I was like, I want to share this with everybody else. And she said, the Bethel young adult community poured into me uh, in the moment that I got there. They wanted to know me genuinely. They helped me see that my true purpose in life was not to pursue relationships with boys, uh, but to serve God. And that I was able to build some amazing God-centered relationships with those around me at Bethel. I found that my faith has grown tremendously through having a group of believers standing along with me, holding me accountable, and serving God together. I then was able to join a team uh, before leaving for school, and I was able to be mentored through older believers at Bethel, as well as start to pour into and love younger people as well. I am so thankful that God has brought Bethel young adults into my life. It has truly changed the purpose and direction of my life towards God. And the reason why I share that story with you is because it's my prayer and everyone's prayer at young adults that everyone that walks through our door would experience that through the love and the acceptance of those around them, that they would, sh- they would see that they are loved, that they belong, and that Jesus loves them. And it's so cool to see that this girl came and was impacted by the love of Jesus through these young adults. And now she is going, and her life purpose is directed on doing that same thing. That is my favorite part about lo- like living and working with the young adults, is seeing them learn the love of Jesus and use that love to go and live radically for him. 
And it is so beautiful and it is so amazing to be a part of that here at Bethel. Man, those are some great stories, aren't they? And I just want to continue by sharing just a few statistics of what your generosity has been able to provide during this pandemic. Do you know that we were able to collect over nine tons of food and to distribute that to local food banks and families in need? Nine tons. Uh, We have over 1,200 families that have received food directly from Bethel and nearly 1,700 meals have been shared with frontline workers and their families. And as you already heard, uh, more than $40,000 has been distributed in our community through our COVID relief fund. So I just wanna emphasize all of this has been possible because of your generosity. People contribute at Bethel Church to assistance ministry all the time. But man, especially in this season, we have seen nearly four times the amount of assistance funds come in during this time. And it's just amazing what we've been able to do through that. Yeah, and the reality is, is uh, this simply would not have been possible to do if God had not prepared and supplied the amazing staff um, here at Bethel Church. And so we just want to say thank you to those staff, right? These are the men and women that have been a gift from the Lord, and they have served tirelessly to equip you, the saints, for the work of ministry. During this challenging time and this challenging season, each one of them has risen to the occasion and served the Lord uh, so well, just tirelessly. Uh, if you guys as the Bethel community get a chance, would you just reach out to those, um, to those staff with a thank you for how yeah. the Lord has used them through this time? Yeah. yeah, not only do we have an incredible staff, but we have a group of in- incredible men that lead known as the elders. We have Bethel elders and, and campus elders. Our, our, our Bethel elders are those elders that serve in a capacity of general oversight of the church through mission, through vision, and through their directional leadership. Uh, These Bethel elders, they have been the leading edge during this pandemic. As you might guess, uh, their work has been incredibly complex and difficult. And as I've been working with these men over the last few years, and even more closely over these last few months, I just want you to know that they love you, church family. Uh, They weigh every decision that has to be made very carefully and always through prayer. You know, the decisions that we've had to make recently have been incredibly complex. But the heart behind each of these decisions has always resulted in care for you, the church body. Never control, always care. And we know that the position that uh, we have decided to take as a church that we are convinced of, uh, it comes with this, what I might call a Goldilocks effect, right? Some people think it's too hot. Some people think it's too cold. Some people think it's just right. Some people think we're, we're coming back too soon. Some people think we're not coming back in time uh, that is right for them. And some people are just okay with the pace that's been set. But what I want you to know is that we take the decisions that we have to make very seriously. We take our responsibility very seriously. And we ultimately want to do what's right in the Lord's eyes. And so that's what we believe that we've done, although never perfectly, but always in prayer and always in unity. We also have a group of men that serve as our campus elders, and they serve their local congregations and their local staff, representing their respective campuses through shepherding and leading. And I'm so thankful that we have a plurality of godly and gifted men at each one of our campuses and among our Bethel elders. You know, we aspire to train up biblically qualified leaders and spiritually gifted people at every level of the church And we have done that on multiple occasions and we continue to do that as we appoint new elders. You know, over the last few weeks, you've had a chance to look over and pray over candidates for elders. Some of them are being affirmed uh, for another term and some are coming on board for the very first time. But what I want you to know is that these men, they live lives that point to Jesus and they use their various platforms to speak up about Jesus. Those two characteristics really summarize the qualifications that we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. They're men who live for Jesus and they're men who speak the words of Jesus. These men exemplify each of these characteristics. And I also want to make you aware that Lee Williams, who has served as a Richland campus elder, uh, he's going to be transitioning off the team after serving his term. 
And on behalf of the Bethel community, I just want to say thanks, Slee, for your many years of service and your dedication to the role of Richland Campus Elder. As a reminder, uh, please review the list of Bethel and Campus Elders on our website prior to casting your vote uh, on, on Sunday afternoon. So if you need the link, it's going to be on the screen there for you. Yeah, so considering how COVID has changed everything, uh, and you're most likely watching this from the comfort of your living room, um, we're going to be changing things up this year when it comes to sharing about the church finances and budget. Um, typically, we try to paint a picture of the church uh, budget and finances in, in probably 10 minutes during our business meeting. Um, the reality is, is that Bethel is a multi-million dollar complex organization on three campuses uh, with a preschool in all three locations that serves thousands of people. And it's simply impossible to explain the finances of the church in 10 minutes. So this year, in an effort to communicate as clearly and as transparently as possible, we've created a budget frequently asked questions uh, that takes you deeper uh, than what we can share from the stage. And so I would encourage you to take 15 minutes um, and read through these frequently asked questions in order to educate yourself on what we are asking you to vote on. Um, and honestly, just for a general awareness of how things work at, at Bethel. It gives you a little bit of a, a taste of, of how things work and, and a, a glimpse of behind the curtain. Um, and so a link to these frequently asked questions is on your screen. Well, I am personally confident that Bethel is financially sound, and there are a lot of eyes on our finances to ensure that, that, that it remains that way. Um, the final authority over the budget lies with you, um, the Bethel community and Bethel members. Um, and so uh, as members of the church, these frequently asked questions are intended to be a tool to help you be effective with that responsibility. Um, now, we went into this year confident uh, that God was going to continue to fuel his mission through the generosity of his people. And, and you know, that is exactly what happened this last year, more so than we ever could have imagined. And so I'm going to run through just a few numbers to illustrate that. Okay, our budget this last year was five and a quarter million dollars. Um, while we're still in the last month of the fiscal year, um, we have a pretty good idea of where things are going to land, financially speaking. And it is expected that the general fund giving um, for this last year is going to be in the neighborhood of $5.65 million. All right, this is $400,000 more or 8% above the budgeted amount. Right, and this has been in a season when we haven't had a senior pastor with a lot of uncertainty. This is just phenomenal. Including Bethel Assistance Ministry, COVID Relief, and Cultivate, the total giving this last year is expected to be just around $6.5 million. Right, and so this generosity is absolutely phenomenal. Okay, you don't give to a church, you give through a church. And it is clear that God has been fueling his mission to the world through the generosity of his people at Bethel. Thank you for your faithfulness and for your generosity. It is this generosity that is allowing us to pay off our debt years early, which you will be voting on um, here shortly. And to go into this next year building on the past uh, and looking ahead. While debt can be an effective tool to strategically push us forward, uh, the freedom of being debt-free is significant and has many benefits. What a great way to start off this new year with a new senior pastor and debt-free. Regarding this next year's budget that you'll be voting on, I want to again draw your attention to the website. Okay, on the website, you're going to learn more details about all sorts of items related to the budget. Um, if you haven't looked there already, and in these frequently asked questions, there's, here's some example topics in there. So it's all the details about the budget itself, um, checks and balances that explain how we steward our resources well, how we're addressing financial uncertainty as a result of COVID, um, an update about the Cultivate campaign, right? You haven't heard a lot about that in the last four months. And so where is that? Um, status on the Richland land sale, which again, you haven't heard about for a while now, but, but there have been things happening behind the scenes there and much more. I do want to briefly talk about Bethel's Finance Commission. Um, if you're not aware, the Finance Commission is presently made up of nine men and women um, who take incredibly seriously their responsibility to help Bethel Church steward our finances and our, our, our fiscal resources well. Um, as the finance deacon, Bob Lagonegro has faithfully led the Finance Commission for five years now, and he too is up for re-election. 
Uh, and so you will be voting for Bob alongside the elders um, when you vote on Sunday. Personally, it has been a privilege to serve with Bob and under Bob in this capacity. Uh, there's a short biography about Bob on the website um, where everything else is that you'll be voting on that has more information about the Finance Commission as well. Uh, over these last few moments here in the business meeting, we've had the opportunity to capture where we've been in the last 12 months and celebrating God's goodness and his provision for our church, your generosity, and more. But the truth is, is we're not done yet. We know that there's so much more to come. Uh, we're looking forward to this next chapter of Bethel Church. Just speaking for myself, I could not be more excited for what comes next. Although sometimes I know it's hard to see that in the middle of COVID. And so Jason is going to share more about what that looks like and what comes next. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Yep. Well, I'm going to go ahead and adjust here. You know, I know that for some of you at Bethel, you've known me for quite some time. And for many more, uh, we are still trying to get to know each other in this process. And I want you to know uh, that I'm, I'm not like a lot of pastors uh, that I know. I have more of a missionary bent, as you're going to see or maybe you've experienced with me. You know, I have an incredible heart for God's kingdom being expanded both locally and globally. And to be honest with you, my mind is constantly racing. I'm, I'm always dreaming about uh, what's the next mountain <laughs> that we need to climb? Uh, what, what is the next battle that we need to step in and fight? What's the next uh, piece of land that needs to be taken? I'm, I'm never just sitting around, lying down and wondering uh, what it looks like to be comfortable where we are, nor am I ever convinced that where we've been is good enough. I heard someone say once of churches that when your memories exceed your dreams, the end is near. When your memories exceed your dreams, the end is near. Wow. I guess that what, what, what that means is, is that you and I need to be dreaming, right? Which is where we find ourselves right now. We're dreaming about what, what's, what's next for Bethel. Here we are in this season, and I don't know about you, but I've heard people use this phrase, what is the new normal going to look like? And I don't like that phrase, and perhaps you don't like it as well. But there is a next normal that's coming. Not all of it's going to be new. Some of it will be new, but largely it's going to be a return to things that we've known before. So I want to ask that question for us as a church. What is, the, what, is, what is the next normal for Bethel Church? Or maybe a better question is, what's the next chapter for Bethel Church? Because we're not starting from scratch. We're continuing on the incredible legacy that has been Bethel Church for a number of decades. And so as we ask the question, as we dream about, as we pray about, God, what's the next chapter? I have really good news for us today. The good news is this. God has an answer. And we don't have to look too far to find the answer that God has for us. As a matter of fact, I came across the answer during our summer reading plan. If you've been in our same page summer uh, reading through the book of Psalms, uh, we read a number of weeks ago, Psalm chapter 33. And I just want to share one verse with you. Psalm 33 verse 1 says this, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Three things that I want you to see in this simple verse. Number one, God has a plan. Isn't that good news? God has a plan, which means that you and I don't have to come up with a plan. You know, when he, when he says he has plans, plans are a series of, of steps, right, to be carried out with, with a goal or an accomplishment in mind. And one of the ways to find out what God's plan is, is to go fast forward all the way to the end and say, okay, once God's plan's accomplished, what are we going to be doing? Where are we going to be? What does that look like? I want to take you to Revelation 7, 9 that paints a picture of what the accomplishment of God's plan looks like. Here's a glimpse at it. Revelation 7, 9 says this, after I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Did you see it? What God's will and God's glory is ultimately going to lead to and accomplish is a great multitude that, can, that is, consists of every nation and every language and every color glorifying God. That's the end. 
And the reason, listen to this, that there is going to be in the end a great multitude is because in this life and through our lives, there was a great multiplication. That's God's plan. He's aiming towards a great multitude and he's going to accomplish it through a great multiplication that comes through his people. That's his plan. There is no plan B. God doesn't need a plan B. He will make his plan A work every single time. God has a big picture and God has a big plan. So the question for us is, is God, what is our part in your big plan? God has a plan. Second thing I want you to see is this, is that we must hear from the Lord about his plan. That's the better question to ask God. What is our part in your plan? And notice again in Psalm 33, verse 11, God's plans are based upon his heart. They are the plans of his heart. So what this means is that in order to to see God's plan, you and I have to seek God's heart. And how do we seek the heart of God? Well, God hasn't hidden his heart. It's, it's all over scripture. But one of the greatest places that we can go to seek the heart of God is to see the heart of Jesus when he walked the earth. Now, there are a number of things that Jesus uh, did while he was walking this planet. I just want to capture that in two words for you as we think about seeking the heart of God and seeing the heart of God in the life of Jesus when it comes to Bethel and perhaps what's next for us. And those two words are restoration and relationship. We love restoration, don't we? Our our, our nation is consumed with restoring things, whether it's furniture or homes or cars or people, right? Whatever it is, we, we love to see old things made new. We love to see broken things restored. That's exactly what Jesus loved. That's exactly what Jesus did while he was on planet earth, right? You think about as Jesus navigated through those three and a half years during his earthly ministry, where was he going and what was he doing? Well, he was interacting with these people and everywhere that he went, he was restoring things. Sometimes it was physical things. Sometimes it was emotional things. Sometimes it was was in various ethnicities. It was racial things that he was restoring, spiritual things that he was restoring. Jesus was about restoring broken things. And you and I, if we're going to seek the heart of God, we need to see that he is about restoring broken things. I think that's a part of the next chapter of Bethel Church, seeing restoration take place in people's lives. But not only that, as Jesus went around restoring things, it was always, uh, it was, it was always around relationships if, if you were to capture Jesus' life, what you would see in Jesus' life is it was all about relationships, namely three relationships. It was Jesus' relationship with his father. It was his relationship with his disciples. And it, it was his relationship with those who weren't followers of God quite yet. His relationship with the world. And when you think about what you and I should be doing in our lives, if we should be, uh, as, as Jesus followers, embodying what Jesus did, as we seek the heart of Jesus, we should be about restoration and we should be about relationships. Well, what kind of relationships? The same type of relationships that Jesus was a part of. Our relationship with God, our relationship with our church family, and our relationship with the world. And listen, I know that we're in lockdown still, that we are still quarantined and we are far away from each other, but that does not mean that we cannot be a part of God's restorative plan on planet earth and build up the relationships that he's called us to, to develop our relationship with God during this season away through daily devotion, daily Bible engagement, daily prayer, to to establish and deepen our relationship with our church we, we can't see each other in the way that we want to, but, but we can see each other and we can engage online. We can meet in group life through Zoom or through these outdoor meetings, outdoors in the tent. We can certainly develop our relationship with the world right now by walking across the street and serving our neighbor, serving our coworkers, serving those in need. We've got to hear about the Lord's plan. And in order to do that, we have to understand his heart. May we continue to seek his heart during this season. But lastly, 
Number three, you need to know this, that his plan impacts generations to come. The plan that he has and the heart that he has is for each and every generation. What Psalm 3311 again says is that God has counsel. That is, God has wisdom and his wisdom stands forever. Where earthly wisdom comes and goes in each and every generation, God's counsel and wisdom is good and it stands in every generation. It will endure until the end of time. And that wisdom that he's given us, that plan that he's laying out before us, it's, it's, it's bigger than us. God wants to do something in Bethel Church, but he wants to do something bigger than that. He wants to do something in our communities. He wants to do something in, in our region of the world. He wants to do something through Bethel Church in the world, but even beyond that, he wants to do something bigger than even our lifetime. God wants to work in each and every generation. And don't just think little kids, but think little kids. He wants to do a work in every generation that is a new generation that's going to put their trust and hope in Jesus alone. Whether you're six or you're 60, every generation being brought along and matured. You know, I want you to think about this. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't take his disciples with him, did he? And you know why, right? It's because he had something that he wanted them to do first. He wanted them to be with him. But for, in order for them to be with him forever, he had a task for them first. And their task was to go and multiply themselves out in all nations and in every generation. You and I are no different. You have been born to live, but you have been born again to multiply. Our salvation, get this, it doesn't just deliver us from sin. It does that. But it also sets us free from meaningless living. We get to live for meaning and purpose. And that meaning and purpose is multiplication. And and through spiritual multiplication, just think about this. Your limited years on this earth, they can have exponential and enduring influence for all of eternity. So I want to invite you, church, to disciple again another generation to reach back and give the good gifts that you have been given to another generation, to invest in them, to see them come and follow Jesus and become fishers of men themselves. You know, the trails that I believe God is t- calling us to blaze in our next days and in our, in our next chapter, these are trails that our children and our grandchildren and even our great-grandchildren are going to run on as they themselves seek to expand the kingdom of God on earth. And if we're found faithful in our generation, our kids and our grandkids are going to be able to run in God's glorious plan. Isn't that an awesome thought to think about? Well, with all of this in our minds, I just want you to know that we, we are trusting God with the next chapter of Bethel Church. We are seeking the heart of God as we seek out our unique role in the plans that he has in this world. And again, just to know that it is flowing out of his heart that he wants to seek the restoration of all things because he is the God that makes all things new. I hope that you'll join us in that. And I hope that you're ready for this next chapter that God wants to write in and through Bethel Church. And by the way, we're not gonna wait. We're not going to wait until this pandemic is over. We want to see the world, the the word come to life. And we want to see the Lord work here and now. That's what we want. My desire is for this time to be remembered, not as a time where the pandemic overtook the church. I hope and I pray that this is a time that it will be remembered as a time where the power of God was on display in the church in a way, perhaps, that it hasn't been on display in an entire generation. For those of you that are Bethel members, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in today. For those of you that are not yet Bethel members, thanks for your role. Thanks for whatever brought you to attending Bethel or perhaps you're in the place of just checking out Bethel at this time. We want to invite you to step away from meaningless living and live for something that really matters as Christ does a work in your life and multiplies it through your life. 
For those of you, again, that are, are members, I just want to remind you that voting is going to be open on Sunday from 3 to 6. If you're looking for instructions on any of the stuff that we've talked about today, you can visit our website. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us. 